But Wayne will be speaking to us this morning, and I've been asked to read a passage from Exodus chapter 9. So if you have a hard copy Bible, open it up there. If you've got your phone, it's a, it's a, it's a fair chunk. So it's worth opening, opening up the Word, open up your app, and turn to Exodus chapter 9, 13 to 35. On the theme of Passover, this would be titled, A Plague of Hail. What a way to start. Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh. Tell him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go so they can worship me. If you don't, I will send more plagues on you and your officials and your people. Then you will know that there is no one like me in all the earth. By now I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth. But I have spared you for a purpose, to show you my power and to spread my fame throughout the earth. But you still lord it over my people and refuse to let them go. So tomorrow at this time I will send a hailstorm more devastating than any in all the history of Egypt. Quick! Order your livestock and servants to come in from the fields to find shelter. Any person or animal left outside will die when the hail falls. Some of Pharaoh's officials were afraid because of what the Lord had said. They quickly brought their servants and livestock in from the fields. But those who paid no attention to the word of the Lord left theirs out in the open. Then the Lord said to Moses, Lift your hand toward the sky so hail may fall on the people, the livestock and all the plants throughout the land of Egypt. So Moses lifted his staff toward the sky and the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flashed toward the earth. The Lord sent a tremendous hailstorm against all the land of Egypt. Never in all the history of Egypt had there been a storm like that with such devastating hail and continuous lightning. It left all of Egypt in ruins. The hail struck down everything in the open field, people, animals and plants alike. Even the trees were destroyed. The only place without hail was the region of Goshen where the people of Israel lived. Then Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned, he confessed. The Lord is the righteous one and my people and I are wrong. Please beg the Lord to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. All right, Moses replied. As soon as I leave the city, I will lift my hands and pray to the Lord. Then the thunder and hail will stop and you will know that the earth belongs to the Lord. But I know that you and your officials still do not fear the Lord. All the flax and barley were ruined by the hail because the barley had formed heads and the flax was budding. But the wheat and the emma wheat were spared because they had not yet sprouted from the ground. So Moses left Pharaoh's court and went out of the city. When he lifted his hands to the Lord, the thunder and hail stopped and the downpour ceased. But when Pharaoh saw that the rain, hail and thunder had stopped, he and his officials sinned again. And Pharaoh again became stubborn. Because his heart was hard, Pharaoh refused to let the people leave, just as the Lord had predicted through Moses. Thanks, Wayne. Uh, I had no idea when I prepared this uh, message earlier this week that Friday we were going to be visited by a hailstorm. So it didn't quite make it all the way down to this end of our city, but uh, those in the north certainly felt some of the devastation and you probably saw it on, in the media as well. Uh, at the end of my message, we will have what we call the Feast of Jesus. You may know it as Communion. If you didn't receive one of these as you came through the door this morning, could you just put your hand up because you're going to need it and the First Impression team are going to bring those to you. Just keep your hand up until you receive that. Now, some of you may, I'm sure all of you have got some awareness of what's going on in Israel and the Middle East since the attack in October of last year. Uh, And... I spoke a little bit into this in a message that I gave on March the 10th, which I called What Makes God Laugh. Now, that's available on our YouTube channel. And so uh, if you want to sort of get a bit more understanding and if to go and watch that, March the 10th, What Makes God Laugh, and you'll find it there. 
But this morning I want to talk about being freed to serve God because that's the essence of what was going on in the, in the account that was read to us. This encounter that Moses had with Pharaoh in Egypt many, many years ago. That we, God wants to set people free to serve Him. Freedom's a really dangerous thing. There, there is no such thing as freedom without boundaries. Everyone understand that? Parents understand that. Children go, you know, let me do that. But we all function within boundaries. We have a freedom within boundaries. Where there's no boundaries, it's actually really scary. So the freedom that God created us to do is to have a freedom to serve Him. And so that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. As I was prepping, uh, a song jumped into my head. And... um, some of you may be old enough to know this song. It's a Bob Dylan song from 1979. It's from his Grammy Award winning album, Slow Train Coming. And it's the opening track and it's called Gotta Serve Somebody. How many of you know this song? I'm not going to invite you to sing it. Oh, it's more than I thought. Okay, some of you can go look it up. Um, Bob Dylan's a bit of an acquired taste, actually. I just have to say that in terms of music. He was, he was a great poet. Um, and one of the things about songs back in those days is they really told stories. So uh, I'm going to show you some of the first, uh, the first verse and then the chorus. It's a seven-verse chor- seven song, so I'm not going to walk you all the way through it, but just, just have a look at the first one. He says, You may be an ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls. But you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And the verse 2 goes, You might be a rock and roll addict prancing on the stage. You might have drugs at your command, women in a cage. You may be a businessman or some high degree thief. They may call you doctor or they may call you chief but you're going to have to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you're going to have to serve somebody. Well, it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. And I thought this thing actually captures really the truth of Scripture. Uh, and it was actually, um, you know, it's known as Bob Dylan's Christian album. He's released subsequent ones that weren't so Christian, but this one is known, Slow Train Coming is known as his Christian album. And it, and it goes on like that for seven verses, and you can find it on YouTube. And each, each, um, each of the verses is filled with these rhyming comparisons, followed by this chorus, this, it keeps repeating over and over again, declaring, you are going to have to serve somebody. And the reality is, we are serving somebody. We are all serving somebody. And it may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but we're all serving somebody. And in Dylan's song at that time, Lord meant Jesus Christ. That's who he was meaning. So thinking of this concept of we are freed to serve God, that's actually what God wants to have. So the idea is, if you like, in the Bible, that actually because of a our choices, uh, we actually have ended up in bondage. We've ended up in slaves and captivity. And really the story is told through, through the book of Exodus of, of the children of Israel, the, their physical imprisonment and slavery. And God had created this nation to redeem the world and to, for that nation to show what God was like. Now they're not there yet. They'd gone into Egypt, if you're familiar with the story, they'd gone in as one family, the family of Israel, through, this, through the son Joseph. And this, what we're reading, is part, one part of ten confrontations between Pharaoh and God, the God of the Bible. Yahweh Elohim is one of the ways, which means the Lord Almighty, that's one of the Hebrew words that is used to describe Him. So... If you can think about that. And, but there's this consistent pattern of Moses goes and speaks on behalf of God. And he says similar words to what we find in verses 13 and 14. If you've got your Bible text open, where he says to Pharaoh, Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God, the eternal God, has said to me to come and tell you, 
let my people go so they can serve me. If you don't do this, there's going to be a consequence. I love God's mercy. It's like, do this. If you don't do that, this, is, this will happen. Isn't that, That's just brilliant parenting, isn't it? We teach our children consequences. We do it in the school context as well. We say, do this and it will go well with you. Choose these things, you get infringements, you get a whole range of consequences with that. And Pharaoh refuses God's opportunities to repent. Now, put yourself in Pharaoh's position. You've got a wonderful couple of million people building cities for you. They serve you. Why on earth would you want to let them go and serve someone else? They're your workers. You own them, literally. They're in bondage to you. Um, so he, he refuses to let them go and serve him. So, but I want to suggest to you that even though Pharaoh is actually holding the Jews captive, I want to say to you that Pharaoh is also a prisoner, I believe. And without making too much more of Bob Dylan's song, you've got to serve somebody. You're serving the devil or you're serving the Lord. And that's a very simplistic way of putting it. So I want to say that Pharaoh is actually serving not God. Because you either serve God or you serve not God, if you think of it that way. So Pharaoh is actually a blind prisoner of the ideology of Egypt, if you think of it like this way. Pharaoh is enslaved himself. He's enslaved to what? He's Pharaoh. He rules. He can kill people with the wave of a finger. Right? So what's he enslaved to? He's enslaved to the idea that he is a god. That's what he's enslaved to. You see, the ideology of Egypt was that only kings and rulers were the images of God. Kings and rulers were the images of God. They bore the image of God and they were in a form God. Ordinary people did not have the same worth as royalty. And that is a common value in cultures without the Bible. You see, in Genesis, which is the opening book of the Bible, it tells us that God created everything. This eternal God who Moses is representing to Pharaoh. And it tells us that on the sixth day, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, if you just stop and you think about that verse for a moment, which I want to invite you to do. In God's image, he created male and female. And the Bible is telling us that all humans are the images of God. Rich and powerful people, poor and weak people, all have the image of God imprinted on them, which means that all humans have a value to God. You mark things that are yours. Your, what belongs to you, you mark it with your stamp of ownership. This belongs to me. And if you want, I want you to think about it in this kind of way, that God has put a mark on all of you, that you belong to him. So therefore, all people have equal dignity and worth. And this is the truth that has built um, and laid the foundations of what we know as democracy. Because democracy would have no foundation without the image of God teaching from the book of Genesis. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. It, it is not found in cultures other than those that have been influenced by the Bible. Let's go back to Exodus 9. Open up to verse 18 if you've got your Bibles open and notice the timing in verse 18. So, And again, this is to see the mercy of God. God's warning Pharaoh and he's saying to him, Pharaoh, tomorrow... What does that mean? Tomorrow at this time, I'll send a hailstorm more devastating than any, any in all of the history of Egypt. What is that telling you about God? It's telling us that God is merciful. It's saying, 
Moses, between now and tomorrow, you can repent, you can change your mind, you can let my people go free to serve me, and this won't happen to you. God is so consistent with all of that. And there's even an encouragement in verse 19, quick, bring in your livestock and your servants out of the fields. Anyone left outside, they're going to be obliterated when the hail falls. So again, we're seeing the kindness of God here. It's the warning. It's the mercy of God. His kindness and mercy to Pharaoh, even in spite of all that's gone before, all the things that Pharaoh said no to, God is still giving Pharaoh an opportunity to repent and to turn to him. And the great thing is that God's mercy is available to every single person. Each of us in this room, we can avail ourselves of God's mercy today simply through the act of humility and submitting and saying, Jesus, I surrender to you. I will live for you. It was wonderful to hear all these testimonies, the four boys up here this morning. And I love the fact they all finished with scripture readings as well. So powerful. All right. So there's this wonderful mercy. And, and if you notice in verse 20 as well, what happens, I think it's verse 20, uh, there's people who listened, right? Some of the officials listened to what Moses said. And they got on the phone or the equivalent, they called their servants and they said, quick, bring the animals and you guys get undercover. There's a storm coming. They were wise, hey? So even though they're serving Pharaoh, they're listening to what's going on with Moses. They've looked at the evidence that's gone before and like Moses said, this was going to happen and it happened. Moses said, this is going to happen and it happened. Moses said, this, right? And so they're paying attention now. God's got their attention and there are some of them that go, we need to... We need to get our servants and our livestock undercover because this hailstorm is coming. There was no question in their mind. It was Pharaoh that just refused to listen to it. So the hailstorm comes. It leaves Egypt in ruins. Except where? This Goshen, the place where Israel lived. Fascinating. This place of safety under the covenant of God. So, and of course, Pharaoh does what he's been doing and the pattern keeps repeating itself by verses 27 and 28. He says, I've sinned. I've sinned. I've rebelled. Rebellion's another word for sin. If you, want to, if you don't like to be a sinner, just say, I'm rebellious. Right? Because I'm not submitted to God. I'm rebellious. Right? If that makes it more palatable, the outcome is still the same. (laughs) Pharaoh says this. Interesting how even someone whose heart is hardened against God, when the evidence presents itself, he says, the Lord is the righteous one. God is right. Yahweh Elohim is the righteous one. Please beg him to stop. And what does Moses say? It's interesting again. Remember at the beginning, Moses said, tomorrow this is going to happen. And so Pharaoh calls, and it happens, and Pharaoh calls him in. He says, I'm wrong. Please ask God to turn the hail off, right? And Moses says, he doesn't do it straight. straight. He says, when I leave the city, (laughs) right? Pharaoh's been known to change his mind. He's got a pattern here going on. So you've got to see the patterns here. Pharaoh's changing his mind. So Moses leaves the city and prays, and what does God do? God turns the hail off. And then what happens? Pharaoh's pride re- rears its ugly head again. How many of us may have experienced that? Something happens. We cry out to God. God delivers us. We go, glad that's over. I'll just keep going on with how I want to live my life. And we actually forget the vows. And I was encouraged to hear the boys, I can't remember which one it was, shared testimony about, they said, Lord, if you help me. And they've kept their word because God is faithful and they've entered into the faithfulness of God. And so Pharaoh, but Pharaoh doesn't. Pharaoh hardens his heart. He refuses to let the people go to serve God. And and listen to what God says to Pharaoh in verses 15 and 16. This is wonderful. I love this. God says, to Pharaoh, he's trying to give Pharaoh perspective. Remember, Pharaoh's captive and imprisoned to this ideology that he is God, that he's in control, right? 
Oh, we could draw an easy comparison with political leaders today, couldn't we? And people that think they're in control, but we won't go there. You can go there. God says, by now I could have lifted my hand and struck you and your people with a plague to wipe you off the face of the earth. But I've spared you for this purpose. I've spared you for a purpose, Pharaoh. I've spared you because I want to show you my power and I want to spread my fame throughout the earth. This actually came to be. If you know, for those, some of you know how the story progresses through the book of Exodus. And it's when they, when they actually leave the land and they begin, the word spread, has spread throughout the region. And there's a terror of God because they've heard that the God of Israel, you don't want to mess with him. You don't want to mess with the God of Israel. And God says to Pharaoh, I could have destroyed you, but I wanted to show you my power. Why does he want to show Pharaoh his power? Is this a power game? Is this a power trip, do you think? God's like, you know, you know, I'm bigger than you, I got more power than you. Or is it something about Pharaoh, I want you to know that I am God, you are not God, and I'm inviting you to worship me, to bow down to me, which is God's invitation for all humanity. Recognize you are not God. You are not in charge, you are not in control, but I am. Will you bow down and serve me? Could have destroyed you, but Pharaoh, I also wanted all the world to know that I alone am God and I invite you to serve me. And this is the reality. God is wanting the world to know that he alone is God. Yahweh Elohim, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They're biblical phrases for people who don't know what they are. God's wanting the whole world to see and behold him and to know him. And this is what baptism is about. Baptism is the demonstration that Jesus Christ has delivered me from captivity in the kingdom of rebellion. And he's placed me in his kingdom and I'm now freed to serve God. And that's what God wants for all of us. And this morning, we want to, at the end, I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer. And for some of you, it may be the first time you prayed this prayer. And some of you might have been sitting in this congregation even for years. But this time, it'll be a prayer you pray from your heart to really surrender and say, yes, God, I'm giving you everything. I'm surrendering my life. I want to be taken out of captivity and rebellion against you. I want to come into your kingdom. I want to be free to serve you. See, the biblical story really centers around three great freedom events. Number one, this one that we're looking at right now, God freed Israel from Egypt. Number two, Jesus Christ freed us from rebellion and death, freed all humanity from rebellion and death. That's why we celebrate the, the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. These are not fairy tales, they're, reality, they're things that really happened. Jesus did die on the cross, he was physically resurrected and he did physically ascend from this earth and he will physically descend back to rule the earth. Jesus Christ, when he returns, he will free creation from uh, death and decay. That's what will happen when he returns. So these are the great freedom stories that the Bible is telling. And I, I love this because it speaks of great hope, right? And if we look at what's going on for, in many, many countries around the world, we look at the destruction and the devastation the starvation that's happening in multiple nations around the world. These are people who are in captivity. The rulers of those nations are in captivity to, a, to an ideology that ref, they refuse to bow down and worship the true and living God. And the consequences of their rebellion are being visited on their people because they are responsible. They're making government decisions. They might be receiving aid money, but the aid money is not going to the people. It's going into their pockets, their personal bank accounts, and the people continue to suffer and die. This is the pride and rebellion of the human heart. It's the exact opposite of the message of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where God laid aside his power and authority and took on human flesh and humbled himself and became a man, died a criminal's death, the lowest of the low who was treated. 
to show us that this is the kind of God that He is. You won't find any other God like this. You can search every other religion you want. You can search even the New Age movement. You do not find a God like the God of the Bible. And part of God's plan is that He initiated seven annual festivals to teach each new generation these freedom events. These seven festivals, they they remind His people of what He's done and what He's going to do. And New Life Church, we've been celebrating these seven festivals since around 2010. That's 14 years. And a number of years, not long after we began um, doing these festivals that, that we find in the Scriptures, I wrote this phrase to capture it, to explain it to people. And I want to invite you to read it with me on the screen behind me. Is it there? You ready? Biblical festivals are God's rehearsals for God's people to participate in God's story centered on God's Son, restoring God's creation for God's glory. This is what the festivals are about. The seven of them. They're telling the story and we participate. We are rehearsing them. Each time we are doing them, we're rehearsing both what God's done in the past and what He's going to do. Just as there was a Passover in Egypt and just as Jesus' death and resurrection speaks of Passover, but there's a future one that's coming. There are plagues that are coming on the unrepentant, similar to the plagues, but Jesus is going to be coming and releasing those on the earth. This is the reality. So they, all of these seven festivals, they are, have a, a, a fulfillment in the life of the nation of Israel. They have some fulfillment in Christ's first coming, and they have, they have ultimate fulfillment, if you like, in His return. So they're pregnant with meaning, and the church is weaker for not celebrating them. And we are so thankful that God led us to celebrate them. And we've grown in under, we have grown in understanding these seven festivals because they're telling the story, and we, and we use this phrase, they're telling the story of God from creation to Christ to new creation. See those? From creation to Christ to the new creation that's coming. And there are so many things that are in fa- uh, not as valuable These seven festivals have a timeless beauty and message that surpasses the human-created events of Christmas and Easter. God's festivals tell far greater story. And I know, and I'm I'm not saying, I know that many Christians are celebrating Christmas and Easter, right? And they're telling the story of Christ. But I'm saying those are human created events in about the fourth century. The biblical festivals predate them by several thousand years and they're God's festivals given to God's people. And when God's people um, follow them, we gain greater understanding of who God is, what He's done in the past and what He's going to do in the future. It is a beautiful story. And so, New Life Church, in obedience to the Scriptures... We are preparing to celebrate the Passover Freedom Festival as we have done in years past because Jesus Christ is our Passover Lamb and He has been sacrificed for us. And this is from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, a bunch of people who are following Jesus in a Greek city. And he says to them, so let's celebrate the festival so we are gearing up for that as was said earlier daily readings began yesterday we've got daily readings that have begun we're 10 days out from Passover so they began yesterday we've got them leading up to Passover and then the daily readings will continue on for the 50 days between Passover and Pentecost because these are seven festivals so for those people who are not familiar Passover includes Passover, unleavened bread and first fruits, which is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. On the festival of first fruits, Jesus Christ rose from the dead, perfectly fulfilling the law. There's a whole lot of things. Then the day of Pentecost, we know that the Holy Spirit was poured out, as was done on Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. That was the first Pentecost. So don't be thinking that Pentecost begins in Acts 2. It begins in Exodus 19. 
And then we're going to fast forward, not fast forward, but then towards the end of the year, we'll enter into trumpets, the festival of trumpets, the day of atonement and shelters, which are speaking of the work of Christ again. There is a beauty and a majesty in these seven festivals. I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, got onto the mailing list, get on the mailing list. Listen to the podcast. Do the daily readings. You can still order a book of daily readings. It's a beautiful book. Have it on your kitchen table and read it around the table at night or morning or whenever you want to do it. Just get into it. Some of you are brand new into New Life Church. This is your first ever, perhaps, biblical festival season. Awesome. Wonderful. We all began where you are right now. We just did it in obedience to Jesus. God spoke to us, and we just began to follow him. And in those early days, we experienced what it was like to be rejected by other members in the body of Christ, because they didn't understand. Some of them thought we were trying to become Jews. We weren't trying to become Jews. We were just trying to be, walk in the fullness of what God's plans are. We're not Jews. Well, some of us are, but some of us aren't. Many of us aren't. So we're not doing them because they're Jewish. We're doing them because they're God's festivals. This is the thing. If you actually read the book, God says, these are my festivals. So we've brought ourselves into alignment. And we've had to learn and we've had to study and we've had to grow. And each year we rehearse them. We gain more understanding of why we need to do them. And they've strengthened our understanding of the story of God from creation to Christ to new creation. So jump on board, sign up. Even if you're visiting here this morning, you can sign up, you can, go to, you can send us an email, you can contact our office and say, can you please put me on, on the mailing list so that I get those daily devotionals? You can do that. You go, I don't know what, you guys, what you're talking about. So I encourage you. We're happy to share this. You can, order a, you can order a printed copy as well, if you want that. We're selling it for the outrageous cost of $5. Unbelievable. It's less than what it cost us. Below cost. Gee, how about that? Anyway. So, let me wrap up this morning. Because my question for us all is, have you been freed? Have you been freed to serve God? Or are you still held like Pharaoh in captivity to some other God who's not God? And today, we want to encourage you to leave that, leave the Pharaoh behind in your own life, in your own thinking. Because Christ came to set you free and for you to walk in that freedom. Would you please stand with me? Now, the words of a prayer are going to come up on the screen behind me, which is, a, which is a prayer for us all to pray. But some of you may want to pray it for the very, you may be praying it for the very first time today. You've never said yes to Jesus before in this kind of way. You've never understood until today what it means that Christ has come to set you free from the Pharaoh that controls you, whether that's your own thoughts, so that you can serve God as he is. That's what God wants for you. And there's a freedom that comes from that. There's a liberty that comes from surrendering to him. So I want to invite you to pray this out loud with me this morning. Let's pray together. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. Please set me free to serve you and become a citizen in your eternal kingdom. Today I bow down and worship you as my God and King. Train me to serve you. Jesus, teach me how to love God with all my heart, soul, mind and strength. Teach me to love people the way you love people. Jesus, help me share the good news of your kingdom with people everywhere. Thank you, God, you have heard and answered this sincere prayer from my heart today. Amen. While you're standing and the worship team's going to come up, would you please pick up this? And the wafer represents the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and that was given to purchase our freedom, to set us free to serve God. So I invite you to take out that wafer and to eat it. Just hold the juice for a little bit longer. And as you eat, just breathe out a prayer of thankfulness to Jesus that he came to die in your place to set you free to serve God. And now if you break the seal on the juice, and it's the color of blood because it speaks of the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from sin, but also blood is what, what flows through Jesus' veins that was spilt for us all, but it's also the fact that when we receive him and surrender to him, we become a member of his family. So we share his blood. So it's a blood that cleanses and, it, and it's also a blood that unites us to him and to all the people who have surrendered to Jesus as Lord right through the ages all across the world. So I invite you to drink in remembrance of Christ. And we, Jesus, we thank you for your great act of redemption that sets us free. And we continue to pray for the world, for the pharaohs of this world, and even the slave drivers that some of us are carrying in our own lives. Jesus, would you set us free to serve you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. For your honor and glory, we pray. Amen.